This clip is from the Buckle Bomb Show. New episodes drop every Sunday here at Bomb Media Productions. Um, but we'll go ahead and talk about WWE in front of the cameras and business-wise, not, not the locker room, uh, in a post-Vince McMahon world. And wow, is that a crazy thing. Like you said, I thought he'd live to be at least 120 and he'd still be sitting in gorilla, you know, screaming at the announcers. But here we are in a, a post-Vince McMahon WWE uh, what do you think the future holds for the product? What changes? What doesn't? We've already seen some things. Of course, right now there's a lot of excitement because of what's happening. And so, obviously, they're going to try and push some things and make sure you see, hey, this is going to be better now. And try and grab a few more eyeballs and keep them. What do you think is going to happen going forward for the product? Well, I think in terms of product, uh, let's face it. SummerSlam was the changing of the guard, per se, from the Vince McMahon regime to the triad regime. Um, one of the last remnants of the Vince McMahon era, in my opinion, was the Miz, tiny balls, my balls are massive. That's something that would have Vince and Gorilla pop and saying, that's good shit, pal. Um, but the change of the guard then went to the main event of SummerSlam when you saw a last man standing match between Brock and Roman. Uh, that had the fingerprints of Triple H all over it. If you think back to the old NXT takeovers in the black and gold days, when Ciampa and Johnny Gargano were having those incredible best two out of three falls matches. So I think going forward, we have a lot to look forward to. And if you would have asked me this question a month ago, I would have had the same ho drum feeling about WWE. You know, as well as I know, I had such a hard time getting any interest in the Raw or SmackDown. You and me have had conversations and privacy of text. Man, yeah. turning off the volume on Mondays and Friday nights and just drinking through, it's a lot more palatable. I would, I would go to, to the bar to watch Raw with my buddy, and we'd sit there drinking, and we'd have it turned on one of the TV, and there's no sound. So it was, and hey, this is, you know, you're getting drunk and there are distractions for when, you know, something stupid happens, you're having fun and whatever, and then you go back to watching and something good happens and you're a little drunk. So it's, maybe it's not good, but it seems better than it actually is. So that was kind of my favorite way to watch Raw. Um, I, um, as far as the future of WWE... There was, I was listening to, uh, and I don't know if you did, um, 83 Weeks with Eric Bischoff last week, and they just did a whole show about what he thinks, what they think uh, the future of WWE will look like. And he had some really interesting comments. I think I, I sent you an actual quote, uh, part of what he said. But he talked about, because he's one of the people who's been there pretty recently, even if it was just for three or four months, back, but it was back in 2019, I think, when he was a big part of that creative in WWE and knows pretty much the modern day process and he didn't survive in it, clearly, but he could speak on it a little bit, probably better than anyone who's not a part of the company right now. And it was... You know, it was great because he would talk about how they would have these intercourse with Vince. You know, you've got to be prepared to take a call at three thirty, four in the morning. And if you're not from a dead sleep to on the phone with Vince, immediately prepared to talk about any little piece of the show that's been written so far, of say, Raw on a Monday and it's Saturday night and he's calling you at 3.30, you have to be on your game. And know what the fuck he's talking about and what part of the show he's talking about or, you know, it's not going to be a fun morning when you walk into the office. So, and, you know, obviously you'd have a show written and he talked about this, you'd have a show written, but there might be elements that you need approval from Vince McMahon from and who knows when you're going to be able to get a hold of him 
it may not be until 10, 11 o'clock at night, if not later. And so now you're kind of sitting there twiddling your thumbs all day long because you can't move forward without this piece because if something needs to change with this or something's different with this, and it probably will be with Vince, then any work you do to move past that is going to all be gone anyway and all for nothing. Excuse me. So, and then, of course, you'd finally have... You know, Monday morning, it looks like you finally got a show ready and come, you know, three, four, five in the evening, you know, a couple hours before showtime, and suddenly, you know, half the show's been scrapped on a whim by Vince. And suddenly you're which, scrambling to put things back together. And and that which was if you go into that was the dirt sheets are oh, you go, go ahead. ahead, man. That was that was what Eric was like there are a lot of talented people there putting the show together and they would have some good ideas and Vince would have, would have great ideas too and was obviously that. But he was so busy and he was such a machine and an animal and expected everyone below him to be that and then also just loved to muck things up, it seemed, it almost felt like, that the process was just killer for on everyone else and really probably... Um, downgraded the level of creative overall and it was the process with him in charge with Vince in charge and he feels like that process and it was that was affecting everybody that would affect Triple H that would affect Stephanie that would affect Kevin Dunn and Bruce Pritchard and Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff in 2019 and everyone that was in creative they were all part of that you know of that bad creative process and had to suffer through it that's what I think can change here and will change I think the creative process will be smoother which will lead to some of the boys and girls getting you know knowing what's happening ahead of time a little more you'll be able to plan things out a little more long term so I think overall the creative will be better. What, what do you think about uh, these comments by Eric Bischoff? Like you said, you know, Eric's been there more recently than a lot of people are commenting on it. Um, I think there is one thing, though, that you miss. I don't know if you were able to see it this week or not because of how busy you've been getting the show put back together. Thank you for that, by the way. Um but it's also being reported that for the last year, Vince McMahon has been struggling with a form of dementia in Macy. Uh, this could have something, if any truth to it, it could be why there's so many rewrites or him forgetting about what he's already done in the previous weeks. Uh, on top of that, too, you know, you have somebody like a Triple H or a Nick Khan, who's now spearhead of the company, who admittedly in the past do watch other products do check social media to see what fans are talking about they're going to have their finger a little bit more on the pulse of what's what's loved in professional wrestling right now uh maybe instead of doing the same stale storylines that are just beat to death over and over and over again we may get some new fresh things uh as far as creative though and I don't know if you want to jump ahead to this yet or not. I think the one thing that I'm most excited for is the potential to see who's going to be coming back to the company now that Vince is gone. We saw that Friday with the return of Karrion Cross. I still call him Killer Cross. Can't take him, can't take the man seriously with hair. Just I can't. It's offensive to me as a I bald hate, man who can't I, grow hair. I thought he looked good, but... Uh. <laughs> yeah, but you want to talk about yeah. a way to make an impact. There was that split second when he did make his debut where... Or re-debut, I should say. Where the crowd wasn't sure how to react to it. Uh, the theme song, Lady Scarlet standing at the top of the ramp... It seemed like there was some hesitation to believe what was going on was actually going on. And then when he took out uh, Drew McIntyre from behind and you realize, holy shit, he's back. I think, and he got a huge pop, by the way. I don't know if you saw after he took out Drew McIntyre. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is just going to be me feeling this way or not. 
But I feel like this could be the start of the floodgates opening back up and people from NXT who were over like Rover down there coming back into the fold on the main roster. Right. I, uh, as far as the returns and all that, obviously, it, it's interesting. A lot of the blame in the sheets and with fans on a lot of the releases over the last couple of years was placed at the feet of Nick Khan, who's now been promoted to co-CEO with Stephanie. But we have uh, Paul Levesque as the lead in talent relations, which is responsible more directly for hiring and firing people. Uh, and obviously some of the people, a lot of these people that were let go were people that Triple H obviously really liked, like a cross, like a Dakota Kai, um, things that we're seeing happen and people returning. And there's already, there was a report yesterday that, Hey, this isn't the last one, you know, Triple H is reaching out to a few people, uh, to try and get them to come back. It's unfortunate that. You know, a lot of the people that are gone, like Adam Cole and Cesaro and and some of the other uh, people that are in AEW right now, they have like five year deals with AEW. So, you know, they kind of slipped through WWE's fingers as far as Triple H, I think, is concerned. And now they're gone for a long time. Um, but there's a few of them, like a Karrion Cross, like perhaps a Wyndham Rotunda who aren't anywhere yet. And I know that makes you giddy. Um, no. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but that whole It Begins Again YouTube page has really shown its card for me when it came to that whole edge and when no more supposed to be a thing at SummerSlam. And that my expectations to ever see a Fiend wrestling character again are slim to none. And... I'm turning a new page. I want to focus on what's tangible and in front of me. If Wyndham comes back, if Bray Wyatt um, comes back, you don't think he'll be the Fiend? Because I can oh, see no, that. No. I can see them being. I can see it being the Fiend, but then moving forward as something else too. Because Bray's, an, from everything we have heard, Wyndham is an a crazy, uh, creative person, and. Now, perhaps, if he were to come back to WWE and some of the some of the strings will be cut off of him and he'd be able to, to experiment even more, do you think he comes up with something different from The Fiend? Or do you think he would return to The Fiend and turn the volume up a little bit? What do you think happens if he were to return? If he were to return, it would be still The Fiend mixed with the Firefly Funhouse. Uh, but I just think we see it get turned up to 11. Uh, you know, as falsely reported a few weeks back, WWE was supposed to make that change to TV 14. And then it was later released that it was a premature release just to try and get the sponsors prepared for what was about to happen. Uh, you now see this more on a weekly basis with the language being used by people on commentary and the wrestlers themselves. Uh, you bring... The Fiend back in with a TV-14 rating and no strings attached. You let him be the creative man that he is. And we're obvious, we're honestly going to see a level of paranormal in WWE that is going to rival what the ministry was in the late 90s. As far as the, the TV-14 versus PG thing, I think that's a little bit... Um, overhyped. Um, even if they go TV 14 on USA and maybe even on Fox, um, which is a, which is another step because that's broadcast TV, eight o'clock. But even if they go TV 14, it's not like, you know, there are a lot of fans that are rejoicing. Oh, I can't wait for that to happen. You know, the Attitude Era will be back. And it's like, no, 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 no. First off, publicly traded company now. Yeah. You've got to be mindful still of things. You're not going to, there's not, no going to be, there's not going to be bra and panties matches. There's not going to be, you know, choppy, choppy, my pee pee. There's not going to be, 
Well, a lot I don't of the crazier nobody. stuff. And I, yeah, and I don't know that anyone's necessarily expecting that far. But I also think, oh, TV 14 is going to be a, a an instantly a better product. And to me, it's like, no, you still have to have better creative overall. Just being allowed to say shit every once in a while isn't going to make the product better. But you are going to be able to bring in the occasional more adult theme into a story that can that can help a story along. Um, you might, you know, if... And again, we're still talking about a publicly traded company. So, you know, do we introduce the occasional blood? I, I don't see WWE ever going back to blading. I just don't think no, that'll ever happen. They're not going to go back to blading, obviously. Um, but with a more adult-oriented limit that you can push, it is going to be good for the characters like, let's say, The Fiend if he does return. As right. far as the spot, as far as sponsors are concerned, especially if it were to happen on Fox, what do you think the most popular day in Fox programming is? NFL Sunday, where you have leading off from the final four o'clock NFL game leads right into a TV fourteen Family Guy that loves to push the limits, that do way more offensive stuff, in my opinion, than what the WWE ever did in the Attitude Era. Right. It It's weird because we've certainly gotten more open about certain things and closed off about others. But I, I think in a good way. Like, yeah. Braun panties matches don't need to be a thing. And nobody's lamenting for that to come back. No, we no. We in a different but, culture now than what we did back in the late But matches. But that was acceptable then and not acceptable now yeah. for good reason. But there are other things that are acceptable now that maybe weren't then. Um, and... You know, things in culture are shifting, I think, for the better for the most part. Um, let's see, where, where else can we go from here? What, what do you think, do you think long-term plans will get better? Do you think we'll start seeing, do you think maybe they're already talking about WrestleMania main events? And... For this year, for this coming WrestleMania. And you know, Vince always has an idea, but that usually shifts by Royal Rumble. What do you think? Do you think they're going to have more plans set in stone? You know, barring the injury bug. Do you, do you think they'll have stuff like that? They'll have things laid out? I would like to hope so. Um, you yeah. know, saying that they do right now is obviously not it's still early yeah you gotta remember they're still dealing with the shock of just having this entire company dumped in their laps um and you still have triple h out there pounding the concrete trying to get former performers to come back underneath a good faith um starting with throwing out the old vince mcmahon book of words uh i don't know if you've noticed this or not yeah. They're, see, see, they, said hospital. they said hospital. They said hospital. They said strap. They're saying wrestler again, damn it. They're wrestlers again. Um, so, yeah, a lot of good faith is taking place now. But as far as long-term storytelling, I mean, whether or not you want to believe that Vince McMahon was ever in Roger Goodell's ear, they've been building the Happy Corbin and Pat McAfee storyline for some amount of years now. I mean, <laughs> but... Seriously, though, I, I think when you look around at what's really popular within wrestling today and you check the internet wrestling community via Twitter, one complaint that everybody constantly has is long-term storytelling. Yeah. Um, and I think we're going to see long-term storytelling more and perfect example of the setup for long-term storytelling, uh, Friday Night SmackDown. You had Pat McAfee and Happy Corbin, and they're still setting something up for the future down the line. Yeah. You have a, a bunch of variables of, you know, long-term storytelling is going to have to take place now that we have this Becky Lynch injury. You know, because it was obviously the big thing was to see Becky Lynch clash against uh, Bailey. So I, I feel like, WWE's kind of put themselves in this position now to where they're forced to go into a long-term storytelling. 
Well, and I think that's always the goal is to kind of know where you're going so that when you get down to an individual show, you have a goal in mind that maybe it's half a year away, but you know where you're going and you can kind of piece things together and know, you know, where to slide the puzzle pieces um, creatively. Um, so about these returns, let's get into, we, we talked about the potential for Bray. Let's talk about the ones that already happened. We, we dove into a little bit, uh, with, uh, Karrion Cross as well and Scarlet. But what about, um, uh, Dakota Kai and this, uh, Bailey stable? What do you, what do you see happen here in EO Sky, which was a name change, but I actually like this name change. It doesn't really change the name too much. It just kind of simplifies it. Well, as you know, uh, EO Sky was allegedly unhappy within WWE. She was looking mm-hmm. to go back to Japan. Uh, now that Triple H is more involved, apparently he was able to talk her into an extension. Uh, Dakota Kai was somebody I was actually really looking forward to see her go to maybe Impact and compete in the stack Impact Women's Division. Because, my God, if you want to talk about a women's evolution right now, that's Impact. Um Impact's got some good stuff in the women women's division going on right now with with Jordan Grace at the top right now, yep. champ, and yeah, absolutely. Uh, and you know, let's face it, Dakota Kai versus Deanna Prazo is just one of those matches that, for me at least, is would be a barn burner. But you've enticed her to come back signing a deal, and now you have her in a three woman stable with Bailey, which the role model gimmick originally for me was very irritating. And now you have her in this role model gimmick as she is molding these younger women to be the apex predators of the women's division. It's it's exciting. Yeah. There has never been a more exciting time in recent history to be a WWE fan. Uh, I'm really jolted up about all of this right now because the women's division, I feel like, is actually going to start getting the respect it deserves Granted, we had WWE have their, you know, respect to the women's division. But I don't think it was sincere back then. I think it was because you had a Ronda Rousey and you had a Becky Lynch and a Charlotte Flair who were constantly burning it down every of every match they had. It put WWE in a weird position where not only were people vocal about it, but you had three great talents, one who was on a mainstream level that you had to shine a spotlight onto. Now that you actually have people in charge who give a shit about professional wrestling, not entertainment, professional wrestling, we're actually going to get to a point where we're starting to see the best of the best again. Perfect example was Sunday at SummerSlam. Yeah. And I know we we were... I was drinking Monday night, and I was... Texting you a lot during Raw. Hey, me watching Raw drunk. Um, and when and I was texting you a lot about the the, the trio there, Bailey and uh, and I and I was like, I compared them to the NWO. I said, give them heat, book heat, Kevin Sullivan book heat. Like they should they should just plow through everyone, cheat to do it, but. They had that uh, six woman tag at the end. They are that they had a match. Excuse me, um, between uh, oh, who was it? It was it was Oscar. EO. It was EO and Oscar, right? Yep. And it, and I'm like, Oscar cannot go over here. EO has to cheat to win, or it has to be a no contest. And sure enough, it ended up being a no contest. And I was thrilled. Like book heat, and you can build to a to a Bailey and Becky WrestleMania main event. Just keep don't let Becky get over, don't let Bianca get over. Every you can I think you're going to have us you know, you can have some sort of six woman tag set up for the clash, I think might be what, ha- what you know, and I don't know what's part. happening. Yeah, uh, now. Becky's Be- Becky's Oh, Becky's not happening, but you legit. had you had Asuka and Alexa. Yes, uh, with, Alexa. <laughs> how can you forget Plus, Alexa? But, I love Alexa. I'm happy she has a purpose again within the women's division. Just I hope they do a good job at not making Asuka and 
Alexa's inclusion in this feel forced. That's my only little... Yes and no, but I, I think at the end of the day, you know, the the Bailey heel team, that they have to be monsters. Oh, yeah. They have to beat the ever-living shit out of the other three women a lot, I think. And they have to end most shows and every premium live event has to end with them on top. I don't think there's ever a point until WrestleMania. Until WrestleMania and you get to Becky Bailey. Um, or maybe maybe Bianca Bailey, whichever way they decide to go with it. But but Becky, I think, if we're returning to a face Becky when she heals up that shoulder, you know, she's the man. She's one of the one of if not the biggest star they had in 2018, 2019. So I think if you move forward that way, I think that can generate a lot because you get a lot of heat on them and you just want to see someone take these pieces of shit down yeah. and so I, I hope I hope that's the way they go and we'll see if they continue that on Monday I think that's what they were building to last Monday and it was amazing I mean so we started off raw with Becky in the ring shaking Bianca's hand she let everybody know the injury is legit if you go back to the live stream, I even told you it seemed like Becky was kind of favoring that arm a little bit after the match. Uh, then you have her. She's in the whole sling and everything. And not because they needed to. Because you already knew Becky was going to be off TV. But because they wanted to put it in your brain that this is going to be a monster female faction. They used it to get more heat. The beat down. Yep. And it, beautiful, beautiful maneuver. Slight changes. In WWE like that is what's going to keep propelling them to just be must-watch television every week again. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Looking forward to that. All right. Is there anything else uh, you want to talk about WWE's future-wise? or Another thing I wanted to bring up real quick. Verbiage. We alluded to a little bit with Vince's book of band words seemingly being thrown out. But not just amongst the wrestlers. You look at commentary as a whole. One thing you and me constantly gripe about is the commentary seems stale. It seems it's basically word vomit because they're hearing whatever Vince is saying and vomiting it out. And what we're going to get into a little bit, le- we're going to get into a little bit later about how much that's changed. But just certain things that are said or like certain like weird like backhanded compliments that seem like maybe inside jokes if you look pay attention to backstage news things like that it seems like the commentators are more free and open and actually excited to do their jobs granted this could be just the first week and we have to get through the honeymoon phase and all of that but it it's making it exciting to see what could potentially be down the line certainly uh michael cole got a lot of praise excuse me for SummerSlam. And, you know, oh, it was the best Michael Cole we've seen in a while. I've always liked Michael Cole. Certainly when he doesn't have Vince in his ear. And there's been a couple of times that that's happened. He seems to be a lot better. He still has to do, you know, it, when you're an announcer, a commentator for WWE, there's a lot of shit you have to run through uh, each segment. You just have to be on your game. And he always has been. Um, and that's why he's always been in that chair despite a lot of fan disapproval over the years um he's really good at railing through all the ads and all the spots and all the things and 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 being the producer that he is at that table um but now actually him actually being allowed to say what he wants a little bit more at uh on the mic is uh, is great and i think the same pat apparently pat mcafee's there was never anyone in this year, and he talked about that. Like they just let me go, and that's what made I think that's what made him so great, and that's what made Cole better next to him. The preceding announcement has been paid for by Bomb Media Production.